The Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus Step 1. On Renunciation When writing to the servants of God, it is best to begin with God himself. Our God and King is indeed good, supremely good, and all good. Of the intelligent creatures made by him and glorified with the honor of free will, some are friends of him, while others are truly his servants, still others are worthless, and others are completely separated from God. Still others, although they are mere creatures, are counted as his opponents. When we say friends of God, Holy Father, we mean people who surround God as intellectual and incorporeal beings. As for the worthless servants, we speak of those who, after receiving baptism, have not kept the oaths they made before God. By those who are separated from God, we imply the heretics and unbelievers. Lastly, by adversaries of God, we mean those who have rejected and fled from the commandments of the Lord and who wage a terrible war on those who wish to fulfill it. Each type of person detailed above could have a special writing dedicated to him. But for the simple, as we are, it would not be useful at this juncture to go into such long evaluations. So then come, in unwavering obedience, to stretch out an unworthy hand to those who are the true servants of God, who piously force us, by their faith, compel us by their instructions. Let us compose this writing with a pen taken from their wisdom, with an ink made from their humility, that is humble and yet shines forth. Let us then write with it on the smooth, white paper of the hearts of them, or indeed, rest it on the tablet of the Spirit, and let us write pious words, or sow seeds, and let us start as such. God is the property of all free creatures. He is the living breath of all of us. He is the salvation of all of us, both the believer and the unbeliever, those who are righteous and unrighteous, the godly and the ungodly, the lustful and the dispassionate, the monk and the layman, the wise and foolish, the sound in health and the sick, young and old. For just as light shines forth from the sun, and the weather changes for all alike, there is no distinguishing between people with God. Romans 118. The impious one is a moral creature with an intelligent nature, who of his free will puts his life behind him, and thinks of his maker, the always existing, as not existing. The iniquitous man is one who makes God's law according to his own fashion and tries to mix faith in God with heresies that work in opposition to him. The Christian, however, is the one who seeks to imitate Christ in thought, word, and works as far as he is able as a human being, believing correctly and simply in the Holy Trinity. He is a lover of God who is in communion with all that is sinless and natural and as far as he is capable, leaves aside nothing good. The continent man is the one who in the middle of temptations, traps, and tumult, strives with all his power to imitate the manner of the one who is free from them. The monk is the one who with his earthly and polluted body strives toward the rank and the state of the angels. A monk is the one who strictly keeps his nature under control, and ceaselessly keeps watch over his senses. A monk is one who keeps his body chaste, his mouth undefiled, and his mind enlightened. A monk is a soul which mourns and is concerned with the remembrance of death, incessantly asleep and awake. Everyone who willingly left behind all the things of this world has done so either for the reward of the future kingdom or on account of the magnitude of their sins or because of their love for God. If they did not leave the world for any of these reasons, their withdrawal was irrational. But God, who lays out our struggle for us, waits to see what we will be at the end of our contest. The one who has left the world in order to shake off the weight of his own sins should be as those who dwell outside the city in the graveyard. He should not cease his stream of hot and fiery tears and the unvoiced grieving of his heart 
until he also sees that Jesus has come to him and taken away the hard stone covering his heart and unbound Lazarus, which is to say our mind, from the bonds of sin, and commanding his serving angels to release him from his lusts, that he may go to blessed dispassion. If not, he will have attained nothing. Those among us who would like to leave Egypt and depart from Pharaoh need a Moses to be a mediator with God and from God. This is the one who stands between action and meditation. Raising hands of prayer on our behalf to God, so that led by him, we also can cross the sea of sin and defeat the Amalek of our passions. This is the reason why those who would have given themselves over to God betray themselves if they think they have no need of a guide. For those who left Egypt had Moses as a guide for them, and those who left Sodom had the angel. The first are like those who are saved from the lusts of their soul by the attention of doctors, those who left Egypt. The others are like those who wish to depart from the defilement of their miserable body. For this reason, they require a guide, an angel one might say, or at least a guide who is equal to an angel. For according to the measure of the depravity of our wounds, we need a guide who is an equally well-trained doctor. Those who desire to rise with their body to the heavens need first to struggle and to constantly suffer, especially in the first part of their renunciation, until their inclination to pleasure and unloving hearts reach the love of God and purity by a manifest grieving. A great labor, very great, with unseen grieving, most especially for those who live recklessly, until by simplicity, lack of anger, and toil we force our mind, which is a hungry dog of the kitchen given to barking, into one who indeed loves purity and watchfulness. Let those of us who are feeble and lustful have the courage to present our illness and feeble nature to Christ with undoubting faith and speak to him, and we will confidently receive his help even though this is beyond what we deserve. But only if we unrelentingly move to the full depth of our humble nature. Everyone who goes into the worthy fight, which is both narrow and difficult, but also light, should understand that they must jump into the fire if they truly expect the reward of the heavenly fire to be within them. But let each one study his own character, and let him consume his bread, with the bitter seasoning, and let him drink of its cup with tears, so that his servitude not lead to his judgment. If it be that everyone who is baptized is saved, then I will be silent about the following. To those who embark on this struggle, they must give up everything, despise everything, scorn everything, and remove everything, so that they will be able to put down a strong foundation. A firm foundation consists of three levels, three columns. These are innocence, fasting, and self-control. Let all infants in Christ start with these virtues, using them as their infant-like examples. For you find in a baby nothing which is cunning or deceitful. They do not have an uncontrollable appetite or stomach. There is no body lit with fire. But as they increase, perhaps as they consume more food, their animal passions increase as well. To fall behind in the struggle from the beginning of the struggle provides evidence of our eventual defeat and is a very detestable and risky thing. A good beginning will be important for us when later on we become sluggish. A soul which is strong at the beginning but then loses its vigor is pushed forward by the remembrance of the previous zeal. In such a way, new wings are given. If the soul deceives itself and falls away from the blessed zeal, let it look in detail as to the reason. Let it take up arms with all its strength and zeal against this reason, because the earlier zeal can only be reacquired by the same door from which it left. The one who leaves the world out of fear is like incense that burns, It begins with a beautiful smell, but ends with smoke. The one that abandons the world because of a desired reward is like millstone that always moves about its selfish state. 
But the one who leaves the world because of his love of God has acquired fire from the beginning, and like a fire fed with fuel, it becomes an ever greater flame. Some construct bricks on stones. Still others put columns on the uncovered earth. But there are others who, after going a brief distance, and having warmed their muscles and joints, go even faster. The one that can understand, let him understand this parable. So let us run our race with zeal, as those who are summoned by our God and our King, since the time we have is brief, and lest we should be found on the day of our death with no fruit and die of hunger. Let us be pleasing to the Lord as troops please the general, since we must provide a full account of our ministry at the end of the campaign. Let us be afraid of the Lord no less than brute beasts, because I have observed men who were about to steal, not fearing God, but upon hearing the bark of dogs immediately turned back. What the fear of God did not bring about, the fear of animals accomplished. Let us have a love for God that is at least on par with our respect for our friends. I have many times seen people who scandalized God and had not been affected at all. But those same people I have seen afterward, irritating their friends over some small thing, then use every possible device, offering, and apology both by themselves and with the aid of friends and family, not leaving aside gifts, so that they might regain their former friendship. At the start of our renunciation, it is important that with toil and grief we accomplish our virtues. And when we have made some advancement in them, we stop feeling grieved, or we feel only a little grief. And when our mortal mind is given over to an eagerness, we achieve our virtues with all gladness and earnestness, with love and a godly fire. It is those who, at the very start, pursue the virtues and accomplish the commandments with gladness and eagerness that deserve all praise. In the same manner, those who labor in asceticism for a long time and still find it difficult to observe the commandments, if they observe them at all, are worthy of true pity. Let us not condemn or scorn a renunciation that is based only on circumstances. I have observed men who have escaped into exile, came across a king by chance when he was on a journey, and then join his band, enter his court, and eat with him. I have observed seed carelessly fall to the ground and bear a multitude of fruit. The opposite I have observed as well. I have seen someone enter a hospital with a different intent, but the friendliness and the warm-heartedness of the doctor won him over, and after being treated with care, he was cured of the darkness that was upon his eyes. So for some, that which was unintentional was more firm and stronger than that which was intentional. Let no one say that the burden or the number of his sins makes him unworthy of the monastic oath. Then for the desire of pleasure depress himself, pardoning himself with excuses for his sins. For where there is much defilement, much care is necessary to remove the illness. Those who are well do not go to a hospital. If a king from the world were to summon and petition us to minister before him, we would not tarry for other instructions. We would not come up with excuses, but we would set aside all things and earnestly go to him. So then, let us be attentive, so that if the king of kings and the lord of lords and the god of gods should call us to his divine duty, we should not excuse ourselves on account of laziness and cowardice and discover ourselves with no excuse in the final judgment. One can walk with difficulty, even if bound with the bonds of everyday concerns and the iron of worries. And those who have chains of iron on their feet can even walk, but they will often stumble and get hurt. A man who is unmarried is only bound to the world only by business dealings and he is as one who has bonds on his hands, and when he desires to start the monastic life, he is impeded by nothing. However, the man who is married is as one who is chained in his hand and foot, so that although he desires to run, he is unable. Some people in the world, living carelessly, have asked me, We have wives and many social concerns. 
how could we possibly lead a life of solitude? I answer them, do as much good as you can. Do not speak ill of anyone. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not be boastful. Do not hate. Go to church. Have mercy on the poor. Do not be a stumbling block to anyone. Do not draw near the bed of another and be satisfied with what you receive from your wives. If you do these things, you will be close to the kingdom of heaven. Let us take up the virtuous fight with gladness and love without being afraid of enemies, who, though invisible, can see directly into our souls. If they see it changed by fear, they will fight against us all the more viciously. For those discerning beings have seen that we are not courageous. So let us arm ourselves against them with courage. There is no one who will fight against a determined warrior. Purposely the Lord makes our battles easy at the start, so that we should not quickly return to the world right at the beginning of our struggle. So rejoice in the Lord always, all you servants of His, sensing in this an initial sign of our Master's love for us, and a sign that He has summoned us. When God observes brave souls, He has been known to let them endure conflicts right from the start, so as to crown them earlier. But for those in the world, the Lord hides the difficulty of the contest. For if those in the world were to know the difficulty, they would never renounce the world. Offer up to Christ the endurance of your youth, and in your elderly years you will rejoice in the treasure of dispassion. What is collected when young feeds and comforts the state of those who have become tired in old age. In our youth, let us diligently labor, and let us run attentively, for the time of our death is not known. We have very wicked, perilous, crafty, evil foes, who have fire in their hands, and will attempt to scorch the temple of God with it. These enemies are strong. They do not sleep. They are immaterial and unseen. Let no one, when he is young, listen to the demonic foes when they tell him, There is no need to exhaust your flesh, lest you become ill and sickly. Rarely will you find anyone in this generation who wants to mortify his body, although he may restrain himself from a variety of tasty dishes. The goal of this demon is to make the beginning of our spiritual life slothful and undisciplined, then to make the end like the beginning. Those who are set on ministering to Christ with the aid of spiritual fathers and their own knowledge will strive to find a place and a mode of life and a dwelling place and suitable practices. The community life is not for everyone because of greed, and solitary places are not for everyone because of anger. Each person must ponder what is best for his needs. The entire monastic state is made up of three types of dwelling the solitary place of a spiritual contestant, a life of silence with one or two others, or the patient endurance of a community. Do not turn to the right or the left, but follow the straight road of the king. Of the three modes of life given above, the second is good for many people, since it is written, Woe to him who is alone when he falls into despair or sloth or laziness or apathy and does not have other men to raise him up. As the Lord said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Who is the faithful monk? It is the one who has kept his zeal undiminished, and to the conclusion of his life has not stopped every day to add fire to fire, ardor to ardor, zeal to zeal, love to love. This is the first step. The one who has put his foot to it Let him not turn back. Step 2. On Detachment The man who truly loves the Lord, who has made a diligent labor to find the approaching kingdom, who has made a start of seeing the seriousness of his sins, who is truly mindful of the eternal torture and punishment, who sincerely lives in fear of death, cannot love or concern himself with wealth or possessions, or his family, or earthly honor, or friends, or brothers, or any of the things of this world. But shaking off all his ties with worldly things, and having thus departed from every care, 
and coming to the point of hating his own fleshly body, and having taken off everything, he will follow Christ without worry or doubt. He looks always toward heaven, awaiting help from there. As the saint said, my soul follows close behind you. And as the memorable author said, I have not grown tired of following you, nor have I longed for the rest of men, O Lord. After our invitation, which is from God and not from men, and we have abandoned everything that is written before, it is a true dishonor for us to concern ourselves about anything which will not help us at the time of our death. For the Lord said, This implies looking behind and not being suitable for the kingdom of heaven. He knows how erratic novices can be and how quickly we can turn back to the world through visits, spending time with worldly people. When a certain man said to him, Allow me first to go and bury my father, our Lord answered, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. When we have renounced the world, the demons give us ideas that we should be jealous of those in the world who are merciful and charitable, and to be sorry that we have left aside these virtues. The goal of our enemies is through false humility to either make us go back to the world, or if we continue on as monks, to lead us to despair. One can disparage those in the world out of arrogance, or one can belittle them behind their backs in order to keep from despair and remain hopeful. We should listen to what the Lord said to the rich young ruler who had fulfilled almost all the commandments. One thing you lack. Sell what you have and give to the poor and become a beggar who receives charity from others. Being determined to run our course with diligence and zeal, let us contemplate cautiously how the Lord judges all the creatures of the world. Speaking of those who, though living, are dead, as when we told someone, leave those in the world who are dead to bury their own bodies. His wealth did not stop the rich young man from receiving baptism. And so, it is incorrect to say, as some do, that the Lord ordered him to sell all he had to be baptized. This is more than enough to provide us with a steadfast conviction and the great honor of our vow. It is beneficial to look into why those who are living in the world, who spend much time in vigils, fasting, labors, and difficulties, but when they leave the world and start their monastic journey, as if in some trial or on the ground of practicing, stop the discipline of their previous false and fake asceticism. I have seen that in the world they sowed many seeds bearing virtues, which were watered with vain glory, as by a sewage stream underground, and were hoed by pretension, and for fertilizer were given praise. However, when transplanted into the desert ground, which is cut off from people of the world, and so not fertilized with a putrid water of vain glory, at once they wilted. For water hungry plants will not produce fruit in hard and dry practice fields. The one who has come to hate this world has left despair, but the one who retains an attachment to tangible things has not yet been saved from despair. How indeed is it possible for us not to be unhappy at the loss over what we have loved? We should have diligent alertness in everything, and to this we must dedicate our full attention above all else. For I have observed many in the world who through the concerns, occupations, cares and vigils have avoided their carnal desires, but when they take on the monastic habit, they become free from concern and they defile themselves in wretched ways by the desires of their body. We should take heed with ourselves so as not to trick ourselves into thinking we are pursuing the straight and narrow path when in truth we are following the way which is wide and broad. The following will demonstrate the meaning of the narrow path. A putting to death of the stomach, vigils of standing, restraint in the consumption of water, small portions of bread, the cleansing drink of dishonor, insults, condemning, derision, the deprivation of one's will, long-suffering in annoyances, unquestioning endurance of insults, disregard of sneers, and the habit when ill-treated of enduring it hardly, or when slandered of not being angry, when disgraced by another not to be upset, when reviled to be humble, 
Blessed are those who follow the path we have spoken of, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But no one will come into the heavenly bride chamber with a crown unless he provides the first, second, and third renunciation. By this I mean the giving up of all commerce, friends, and parents, the renunciation of one's will, and the final renunciation of the arrogance that destroys obedience. Come out, you from among them, and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the defiled world. For who among them has ever done a miraculous sign? Who has brought back someone from the dead? Who has cast out demons? None. All these are the great prizes of monks, prizes which those of the world cannot receive. And if they were able, then what would be the necessity of asceticism or solitude? Following our renunciation, the demons warm our hearts with the memory of our parents and family. Let us then fortify ourselves against them by means of prayer. Let us kindle within ourselves the memory of the endless fire, so that by this memory we will extinguish the unseasonable warming of our heart. If someone believes he is without affection for an object, but is saddened by its removal, then he is merely tricking himself. For those who are young and are given over to their lusts and to lavish living, but desire to come to the monastic life, let them give themselves over to fasting and prayer. Let them convince themselves of the need to renounce all lavishness and immorality, so that their final state not be worse than their first. This harbor gives security, but it also opens one to danger. Those who navigate the spiritual seas realize this. It is a pathetic sight to see those who have endured the dangers of the open sea to suffer shipwreck when in the harbor. This is the second step. Those who run this course, let them not imitate Lot's wife, but Lot, and run away.